Okay, good. Um, so uh, we move to uh, Bayesian deep learning. So I have told you that um, I, was, I was going to tell you actually how to compute the confidence also on the segmentation masks. And this is especially useful for autonomous driving and I will also motivate it a little bit more later. Uh, but first let me start by what, what do I mean by Bayesian deep learning? Um, so at some point in, in the deep learning community, we're going to want to go what I call full Bayesian. So we're going to want to uh, have probabilities then we, that can actually be tangible and that we can interpret as such. So for now, uh, deep neural networks are giving us um, just one answer. And it's really hard to know whether the neural network is sure about the answer or not. And this is one of the questions of the community also. Um, so going full Bayesian means uh, pretty much uh, working on this theorem that you, uh, uh, you all uh, probably have seen plenty of times. Uh, so you do have uh, your hypothesis or your model, in this case your neural network, and uh, you have a bunch of evidence, a bunch of data, and this is actually the theorem that tells you how to best compute your model given your evidence. And um, if we're talking about um, neural networks, um, you usually start with a prior on the model parameters. You start with an initialization on the model parameters. Um, you choose your statistical model, which means you say, well, this is the, the architecture of my neural network, for example. Um, you have also collected your data and now I'm going to use my data to refine my prior. And what this means in, in Bayesian terms is essentially computing the posterior. And the posterior um, can be computed by using the bias theorem that we have seen before. So again, um, this is going to be the prior of your model, the initialization of your neural network, um, and this is going to be um, the data um, distribution that you have um, from, in our case, from it would be the distribution of real images. So of course the first thing that we notice is that um, this doesn't really depend on the parameters yet um, and it's also really hard to compute the distribution of real images, right? What, what does that mean? Um, so we tend to actually ignore um, this, um, this denominator and to keep only this expression here. And so um, this expression also in Bayes terms um, is the posterior of uh, your parameters, so your neural network that you want to optimize given your data. And for this, you're going to have a likelihood term and a prior term. So um, the learning of, of the neural networks essentially means computing this posterior. And so what we do um, almost always in deep learning, in, in the case of supervised learning, is actually to compute a point estimate. So with the maximum a posteriori, um, what we have been doing so far is essentially to compute one set of parameters, the best set of parameters for us, um, that actually explains the data. And this is only one set of parameters. Now the other possibility that we could, uh, what we could do is actually, uh, we could find a probability distribution of these parameters. So we're not interested only in the best set of parameters according to whatever optimization algorithm uh, we're using for a neural network, but we're interested in finding a probability distribution of these parameters. And uh, what this would actually mean is, um, well, and this, and this lecture is, is of course um, going to be uh, about this or about like a very simple method uh, of doing this. Uh, but the, the main concept here is that we're going to have to go back um, to the whole expression. Um, so, we know already from, uh, from the many lectures in deep learning and the, the many successes that we have heard in deep learning um, that these models are actually very expressive and we can do classification, we can do regression, uh, we can deal with sequences, um, we can do similarity prediction and we nowadays have many tools so it's also really easy to implement them and we can train it with large amounts of data that fortunately we have also in vision. But they do have a bit, um, some disadvantages. Um, so the famous black box feeling, which uh, we're trying to, um, to overcome with these lectures. Uh, but the most important thing, in my opinion, is that you actually have no idea how confident your neural network is when it gives you a decision. 
So when it tells you that this pixel belongs to a car or belongs to a tree, you actually don't know if the neural network is saying this because it's really sure that this is a tree or it's halfway sure that this is a tree. And we would like to actually have a measure of this confidence. And so um, I would like to know actually what my model knows and what my model doesn't know. Because um, let's, let's assume that we have this, um, this dog breed classifier and you have all these uh, kind of weird dogs. Um, you train your classifier, works really well, 99% uh, accuracy in your, in your validation set, but now you give it a picture of a cat. And um, whatever your neural network is actually telling you, whatever dog breed class is telling you, you know that this is not going to be true. But also, um, but the neural network doesn't actually know. It's just going to give you an answer. It's going to tell you that it's a chihuahua. Um, but this is not even a dog. And the neural network has no idea that this is not even a dog and it should not be giving you any answer. And so I would rather actually have a neural network that is telling you, look, I have no idea what kind of dog breed that is. I'm not even sure that this is a dog. This would be a much more preferable answer. And so um, why do we actually want this? Well, um, if we're talking about having autonomous driving system in five years, uh, we're going to need to make some decisions based on the visual input that we get. Uh, so we need to be really sure whether there is a pedestrian in front of us or it's just some, um, some blurry pixels that the neural network thought uh, was actually a pedestrian. And uh, we also need actually insights on why a model failed when it actually failed so that we can recover from this and we can train better models. So there's, there's a lot um, that we can learn from uh, modeling uncertainty. And so um, going back to, to finding a probability distribution, what I actually mean is if uh, when you train a neural network, you actually obtain um, point estimates. So you obtain, for example, that your weight should be 0 0.8 for this particular layer or your bias should be 3.1. Now what we actually want is the full distribution. So we want to know, look, the, the biases for this layer or this particular bias for this layer lies in this um, probability distribution here. It's no longer a point estimate. And um, as always, when you have a probability distribution, the thing that you can do is you can sample from it. And if you can sample from it, then you can um, obtain um, the uncertainty of a model. And you can do this easily because if predictions are really consistent, so if you sample many, many weights, many, many biases, and your predictions are consistent, you can consider that your model is pretty confident about the decision that it, that it just made. So if you actually do this, if you just um, would be able to obtain this probability distribution for, from, um, your, uh, from your parameters and then you would sample um, these parameters and obtain different, um, different outputs, then you could actually measure um, the uncertainty, which is, which is depicted here in the last column. And so in this case, um, these bright pixels, especially the red pixels, mean that uh, the network is not really sure of what category, what semantic category, um, should be shown here. And you can indeed see that, um, so, so this is the original image, this is the ground truth, and this is the, the prediction. You can indeed see that the prediction of the sidewalk here is actually quite noisy. Um, but of course, if you know that your network is not really sure about this prediction here, well, you can um, actually do other things. You can act on it in a different way than if you just get this prediction and then you have to decide whether to turn your car left or not. And um, so again, why, why do we actually want to have this? And uh, when I was teaching this lecture, on the same day in the morning, I saw this on Twitter. So uh, this is actually in near Seattle. And uh, there are many rivers in Seattle, and apparently it also rains a lot. And when it rains a lot and the rivers go over the road, the salmons also go over the road. So imagine this autonomous car that is driving automatically and then sees a salmon. I don't think there's any TT data set for salmon detection. Um, so I'm not really sure what it would actually detect here. So we do need to have a model that tells us, look, I have no idea what this thing is. You know, I just saw my car and for example, I let the driver decide what to do here. Um, so okay, the question is, um, how can I get this posterior that I've been talking about? 
Um, so the first uh, tough thing is that I do need um, to compute um, this denominator here. And basically what this denominator means is that I need to um, compute the probability of, the, of observing the data, so the data x, under all possible model parameters. So now, of course, my model parameters are not point estimates. I'm going to have a variety of model parameters. And um, I can actually marginalize over these model parameters to get this really nice expression here. So again, we get an expression that um, I don't really want to compute. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to approximate this probability. Um, and there are actually two ways um, of approximating this probability. So we already accept that uh, we cannot really compute all the possible combinations in the, in the denominator. So I'm going directly um, to computing the posterior. And in order to, to approximate this, there are essentially two ways. Uh, one is um, the Markov chain Monte Carlo, and the other is the variational inference. Um, so what do I mean by Markov chain Monte Carlo, and this is like a very, very rough idea of what that means, is that I'm going to have a chain of samples of my parameters. So now my parameters are going to evolve, like in a sequence, and this evolution leads to a convergence to my posterior. Like this is a super high level idea, but I'm not going, uh, uh, not going to go into more details on that. And the second one, which is a bit more interesting, is actually um, the variational inference that tells you, I'm going to find um, a probability distribution that approximates the posterior that I actually want to find. And in order to measure how close this um, probability distribution is to my posterior, I'm going to use the KL divergence to compute that. And so, um, Xavier told me that you already know about uh, variational autoencoders. This is essentially the starting point of a variational autoencoder, and from this, all the, all the formulation leads to the nice um, three terms of the variational autoencoder. I'm not going to repeat that, but um, I, can, I can discuss with any of you if you're interested in that. But instead, I'm going to talk about um, a bit of an easier way um, to actually compute um, the variational inference. And this is a bit um, counterintuitive, but I'm going to use dropout for that. And so um, dropout was initially not intended to, um, for, for Bayesian deep learning. Um, so just as a quick recap what, um, what dropout actually is, um, it's actually a regularization technique. Um, so when you actually train a neural network, um, you probably know it's incredibly easy to overfit to anything. Um, so people have um, invented several regularization techniques. And one really useful one, um, and also really easy to implement, is dropout, in which essentially you take, um, for example, half of the neurons, and you drop them out. So you basically uh, delete them from the model. And this means, of course, also deleting the connections um, that these neurons had with the past layer and with the future layer. And so what you're going to do now is going to train this model with this new architecture with the drop neurons. And what you do is that each iteration, you're actually choosing a different dropout mask. So you're changing constantly the architecture and the connectivity of your neural network. And um, so one thing that, that one has to notice, of course, that if you're actually using half the network, you're dropping half of the neurons, uh, you have half the capacity. So you have trained your neural network for some iterations, now you drop some of the neurons and suddenly your capacity to detect eyes or to detect cars has been dropped. So for example, if we had this really nicely trained dog classifier that um, you know, some neurons were able to detect the furnace, some neurons were able to detect eyes and so on and so forth, and these were all used for um, your dog classifier, now effectively what happens with dropout is um, you're cutting some of these connections. So suddenly the ability of your network to detect tails has been dropped. So there is no neuron, there are no neurons that are um, actually capable of detecting tails. And so what essentially happens then is that the other neurons have to make up for this. So the other neurons uh, will see that there is a potential to learn from tails to have a better dog classifier. And so effectively what you do with dropout is you create redundant representations. 
And this is exactly what you want from a neural network and why uh, dropout is used as a regularizer because you're actually um, doubling the number of neurons that, for example, detect eyes, detect tails, detect ears, and so on and so forth. So you're avoiding that um, overfitting when one neuron is super specialized into eye detection and then it doesn't generalize to, for example, other type of eyes. So this is the, the um, let's say, the original um, intention of dropout to base your scores on more features to create this, this sort of, um, to make your networks also more general. And um, you can also consider it as a model ensemble. And this is where um, the Bayesian view um, comes a bit more into play. And um, a model ensemble is basically when you train, for example, several neural networks for your task. And your neural networks differ from each other. So they all reach to some um, classification score, but if they are initialized differently, if you use different amount of, uh, of training data or different examples of training data, then you're going to reach to different classifiers. And this is essentially what's happening at every iteration when you use dropout. You, you drop certain neurons. So you train one model, which is this, um, these orange neurons here, with a certain number of dot images. Then in the next iteration, for example, it chooses to drop the orange neurons, and now it's going to choose these neurons um, to actually perform the training. But this is the next iteration. So you have a different mini batch, you have different training samples, so you're going to effectively train a different model within your training. So this, you can consider it as a per iteration model ensemble. So now, I mean, the question is, okay, how, how is this related to the Bayesian deep learning and to the salmons crossing the street? Um, so essentially what you can, uh, what, what these people actually show actually in this ICML paper was that you could use the dropout training to perform uh, the variational inference to actually find this uh, posterior approximation. And basically what they said is that you can actually um, consider that um, your distribution, the distribution that you are um, trying to find, so this approximation, actually has a very specific shape. So of course this is, this is not very general, but it has this uh, very specific shape um, of, of a Bernoulli distribution, which is basically when you're turning these neurons on and off, you're creating this kind of distribution on uh, your parameters. And so essentially what we're doing is uh, we're taking on uh, the variational inference paradigm where we actually want to find a distribution to approximate our posterior, but we give this posterior a very distinctive shape. And so essentially how this works is, um, first of all, of course you need to have dropout before every weight layer because you want to have this distribution for every weight of your layer. And uh, you train your model normally with dropout, like you would do um, as, a, as a regular, to use it as a regularizer. But then um, the, the different thing is that you're also applying dropout at test time. And this is the different thing, because usually when you train with dropout, you don't test with dropout. You use the full model to actually um, test um, at test time. But here we're also going to use um, dropout at test time. Um, so since this is, is some sort of sampling, um, that's why basically um, people call it uh, Monte Carlo dropout. Um, but this is because it's, um, so you're, you're sort of sampling these weights in a Monte Carlo fashion. So this is, this is why the name, where the name comes into play. And so um, what you're effectively doing is um, if you have, for example, this classification network here, so you want to know what is the probability of having a certain class C, what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, your neural network, you're going to perform uh, parameter sampling because of course now you can apply different uh, dropout rates and this is like um, sampling from uh, your parameters, again, with the Bernoulli distribution and then you assume, of course, uh, that this approximates um, the distribution that you wanted to find in the first place, this uh, posterior distribution. And this actually works um, pretty well. So these people use it for, uh, for depth estimation. So you see here um, several indoor scenes and uh, the ground truth 
uh, depth. So the, the red means far away, blue means close together, uh, close, uh, close by. And you can see, for example, that um, there are some errors. For example, in this region, things are quite noisy. And when you go and then use the, uh, the method to actually compute the confidence, you see, in fact, that the network is not really too confident about that. So this means that no matter how you sample your network, you always have a different answer in this region. And hence, you can actually judge that the network is not really confident about this region. And you can see also all the other regions where the network was not confident is because we either have no data to train this. I mean, windows are particularly hard for depth estimation. Uh, but you can see that it actually correlates with, for example, a bad result or a difficult region in the original image. And um, so this is sort of one way of computing this, um, uh, this uncertainty. Um, the other way and, and the actual way of getting um, the, uh, the posterior distribution is what I was telling you about, which is the variational autoencoder. And here what you actually assume is that um, this is actually your posterior and uh, your encoder is going to be the approximation that you're going to make. But since um, Xavier told me that you're already familiar about this, I will stop this, w familiar with this, I will stop here and take qu any questions you have. Yeah, you mean, uh, well, you have to do several round, several forward passes at test time also, right? Because you have to sample your dropout mask, you have to apply it, and then you have to run the, um, the forward pass, and you have to do this several times to compute a meaningful uncertainty. So it is a bit more expensive, uh, but this is, it's not meant for, um, or it's not meant yet for real-time computation, but more for uh, model debugging. So to see really what is, what is not working in your model currently. Um, so, of course, if you have to do this in real time, then it, it just becomes too expensive. Um, so how people actually do it for, uh, for doing it real time is more in, in the model ensemble um, way, where you actually have in several GPUs, several networks, either trained completely independently or trained, again, with dropout. And then you can test them all at the same time and obtain the uncertainty and the output at the same time. And then this is real time, but you need a lot of GPUs. Yeah, um, it depends, it depends. So, um, I mean, there's also people that are trying to predict these uncertainties. So once you have this kind of model, uh, then you use sort of a teacher-student strategy to train a network to mimic these uncertainties. So this is something you can do. Uh, but nowadays, I don't think they are actively using it in autonomous driving that I know, or at least that you know they say it and they publish it. But usually nothing is computed in the cloud for autonomous driving. Because, I mean, otherwise, as soon as you lose connection, then it's over, right? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have you noticed why do you think that the drawback that it's an anterior probability, the vector, and one that owns one and other one owns zero? Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, what, I what is one and what is zero? The Bayesian vector. The Bayesian yes. formula. The, the combination, uh, the general formula. Mm -hmm. Has a drawback that if the anterior, anterior probability yes. uh, of all the classes, mm -hmm. if one class owns one probability and the rest of one uh, owns zero, yeah. this method is not going to work anymore But this is general for any, for, for the Bayesian view, right? It's not, yes. it's not particular to neural networks. Yeah. As I know, one people use before offset. Mm-hmm. Offset in the average of all the, the past probability mm -hmm. for, for doing this 
could be i don't know i haven't seen it for neural networks maybe it's because you never get ones and zeros um, so you never get these really clean predictions so probably that's why people didn't run into this problem uh, but I, I have not seen any type of you know discussion regarding this problem you had this problem with neural nets okay then then i don't know how to help you sorry you had also a question yeah. Um, so the, I mean, the, there's a lot of discussion about the softmax layer. Um, so some people say it does give you a result between zero and one, but it's not necessarily a probability. So it, it's a, it could, like, theoretically it's not a probability. It's not defined as a probability. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, this, this is a whole other discussion, right? Um, but I also tend not to interpret that as a as a proper probability. So that's yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the so question. You, so, like, you are trying to, let's say, predict for a situation that occurs very rarely, like having a yeah. the road. So, what you do is you simulate the case in which that situation occurs because your network is. Oh, no, no. You, you actually make um, different predictions with different networks, trained slightly differently, mm -hmm. um, or uh, what would be the same with. Um, with the distribution of the parameters and you sample the parameters in different ways. And then the idea is that um, the network is not going to be, hopefully not going to be sure about the class of the salmon on the road. So it's going to give you car in one instance, road in the other instance. And then from this you can judge that you don't know what that is. Uh, but you don't train then for a salmon classifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. You could see like this. Yeah, yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. um, this I don't actually know for this particular um, paper. So for classification, it's easy, right? Because if it's the same class, then you're certain. Otherwise, no. Uh, for this, I'm going to guess they have a threshold in the depth, and if it's not within this threshold, then they, they say, you know, the network is uncertain. But I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Um, shall I stop this? Okay. <laughs>